I'm Dr. John Cruz, and today I'm going to be talking about ADHD. Is that a mitochondrial disease? In the last few years, there's been increasing interest in what mitochondria do, or particularly when they're not working well, what they don't do, with some people believing that most of the aging process is due to mitochondrial dysfunction and a whole host of mental health conditions, including dementia, depression, autism, schizophrenia, being implicated as problems with mitochondrial disease. And there is some evidence to suggest that ADHD as well may be a form of a mitochondrial disease, although we're sort of behind those other disease states or conditions with ADHD, so there's a little less evidence. But there's some evidence that oxidative stress is frequent in those with ADHD. There's some evidence of mitochondrial dysfunction in those with ADHD. And there's some evidence that substances that act as antioxidants, which would compensate for oxidative stress and help in a situation where you have mitochondrial dysfunction. There's some evidence that antioxidants can help with ADHD. If I were giving this talk 10 years ago, most medical sources would say, mitochondria, mighty mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cells. So do have a particularly prominent and powerful role in generating ATP. ATP is produced at the end of what's called a series of chemical processes, electrochemical processes called the electron transport chain or ETC. And the last step to making ATP is what's called oxidative phosphorylation. So a phosphoryl group is added on. So reduction is gaining an electron. Oxidation is losing an electron or adding an oxygen group. And we know that part of this process of oxidation reduction reactions in the, at the end of the electron transport chain produces not just the energy source ATP, but also is a big source of what are called reactive oxygen species. Chemicals that are highly reactive interact with lots of cells or lots of chemicals in the body. The process by which fats go rancid is an oxidation process. So reactive oxygen species interact with lipids, which cell membranes are full of. Brain is particularly full of. They interact with proteins and degrade and break down proteins. They interact and attack carbohydrates. They interact and break down damaged DNA. So reactive oxygen species are not things you want a lot of floating around. Again, some amount in tiny controlled situations are useful and helpful, but what's called oxidative stress is our, many people measure it by many reactive oxygen species we have relative to antioxidants. So the body uses antioxidants to neutralize or knock out or cancel out the reactive oxygen species so they're not damaging tissues throughout the body. Mitochondria is where ATP is being generated. It's where a lot of the electron transport chain molecules leading into that are situated. So the proximity of these reactive oxygen species makes the mitochondria themselves particularly susceptible to oxidative stress. And there's a few other things that make the mitochondria themselves particularly vulnerable to stress. So the mitochondria have their own DNA. It's separate from the DNA in the nucleus of the cell, which has a nuclear membrane around it. It's not protected by histones. Histones are clusters of proteins that sit on the DNA, inactivating parts of it, but keeping lots of it safe from chemical reactions. No histones in mitochondrial DNA. And also the repair enzymes that fix nuclear DNA when it's damaged are more rudimentary, less sophisticated, less abundant, less active in the mitochondrial DNA. So oxidative stress causes damage to mitochondrial and mitochondria that are dysfunctional actually go and contribute to oxidative stress. So it's a feedback loop. What are the mitochondria? They're little structures or those sausage shaped structures, just a few, one, two, three microns across, which is really pretty tiny. Cells throughout the body have different numbers of mitochondria in them, partly based on how metabolically active they are. So neurons, 
muscle cells, liver cells tend to be metabolically active. They need a lot of energy. They have a lot of mitochondria. Red blood cells don't actually have any mitochondria in them. Most other cells have dozens. The mitochondria are mobile within the cells, so they're not just sitting in one place. They do move around based on where they're needed. Mitochondria themselves, about one and a half billion years or so ago, were bacteria that crawled into bigger cells and found a way to, or the cell and host found a way to survive together and live together. Ancient bacteria, which became mitochondria, again, they have their own DNA. So the mitochondrial DNA codes for 37 different genes, coding for proteins. And yes, the mitochondrial DNA only comes from your mother. Now, this is not because sperm don't have any mitochondria in them. Sperm do. They need a lot of energy to be swimming where they're going to swim. But once the sperm fuses with the egg, chemical processes within that fused cell pretty quickly degrade any of the mitochondria from the father, from the sperm. So all of your mitochondrial DNA comes from your mother. On the other hand, most of the genes coding for mitochondrial proteins, so the proteins that make up the structure of the mitochondria, the proteins that make up the chemical enzymes of the electron transport system, other parts of how a mitochondria is built are actually built on genes that are in the nucleus. So even though all of your mitochondria are coming from your mother, your mitochondria are built from DNA plans that are both from the mitochondrial DNA itself and from your own nuclear DNA. Some of the reasons why the mitochondria themselves are particularly sensitive to oxidative stress, another thing to point out is that the brain is particularly sensitive to oxidative stress. So for the brain, part of the reason is the brain is a high energy system. So a lot of ATP is being generated, a lot of reactor oxygen species are being created. And yet relatively the antioxidant level within the brain is not terribly low, it's just mismatched. And again, some people's measure of oxidative stress is the ratio of reactive oxygen species to antioxidants. So you could have antioxidants are too low or reactive species too high, creating too much of a disparity. That disparity is the oxidative stress level. So how do we measure mitochondria that are damaged or problem and not working well because of oxidative stress, gold standard for measuring mitochondrial dysfunction is to take a biopsy of the tissue you're interested in and using special stains or special processes in a living live state, they're not going to want to say, okay, do a biopsy of my brain just to check how my mitochondria are doing. So most of the research is based on proxy measures trying to look at indirect ways of how brain mitochondria are functioning. And again, Different cells have different amounts, different numbers, different activity of different mitochondria. The mitochondria can turn over. They have their own life cycle. The mitochondria can be formed. Old ones die. So looking at peripheral blood tissue is not always a clear indicator of what's going on in the brain. But one of the studies looking at ADHD and mitochondrial impairment or mitochondrial dysfunction used a system where they took neuroblastoma, so tumor nerve cells, destroyed all the neuroblastoma's mitochondrial DNA from, and they fused those neuroblastoma cells, making a hybrid cell with, different, with cells from different patients. And when they compared those hybrid cells made from ADHD patients with a neuroblastoma versus hybrid cells made from neuroblastoma and people without ADHD, what they saw was in several different measures of mitochondrial functioning with ADHD, the mitochondria were impaired. And again, the mitochondria were coming only from the individual with ADHD in this case, because the neuroblastoma's mitochondria had been obliterated. Another set of studies is looking at genes and looking at variants of genes of those genes that are identified in different studies. There are a number of both nuclear genes coding for mitochondrial proteins and mitochondrial DNA genes that are associated with ADHD. So there's, so not only do we have some measures of actual mitochondrial dysfunction from the neuroblastoma study, there's a few studies showing that many of the identifiable gene 
variants that are contributing to ADHD are associated with mitochondria. So when mitochondria aren't functioning well, they aren't fully making energy robustly. One of the things that happens, the body's attempt to respond is to make more mitochondria. So mitochondrial DNA copy number is a measure of how many mitochondria you're trying to make and an elevated mitochondrial DNA count is a fairly crude, but fairly good measure of whether you have mitochondrial dysfunction. And in at least one meta-analysis, looking at studies out there, the majority of studies did find that with people with ADHD, there's elevated mitochondrial DNA copy number. So again, the body's trying to make more mitochondria because the ones that are there aren't working well enough. On the other hand, that same meta-analysis did not find the amount of antioxidants floating around in the blood of people with ADHD was not aberrant. So it isn't the shortage of antioxidants that was causing oxidative stress. If you have dysfunctional mitochondria, you're going to have an energetically compromised brain. And again, neurons use a lot of energy. So that directly could be how mitochondrial problems are leading to aberrant brain function. Another finding that's been sort of linking the mitochondrial story and ADHD is that oxidative stress in animal models, so several different studies have looked at rodents, there is a decrease in dopamine striatal release. And that actually looks like what's happening in ADHD. So many studies have suggested less dopamine available, less being released in the frontal striatal areas. And you know, 15 years ago, that was considered sort of the cause or the origin. This is looking at, well, why might that be going on? And again, one reason why you might have less dopamine to be released or made there is because of oxidative stress. Final line of evidence that many people cite for demonstrating that mitochondrial problems are contributing to ADHD is looking at, again, combating oxidative stress by boosting antioxidants. So if you give people antioxidants and you see an improvement in ADHD, the claim would be you've restored some oxidative balance and you're decreasing the amount of mitochondrial dysfunction. And the three substances that have been most studied and cited by researchers are omega-3 fatty acids. So there's a fair number of studies looking at omega-3s, icosapentaenoic acid, EPA, and docosahexaenoic acid, DHA. Treating people with ADHD with those omega-3 fatty acids does lead to an improvement. It's not usually as robust in effect as giving them stimulants, but it's measurably so. And there's at least two other antioxidants that have been cited in, and again, the mitochondrial research studies. So there's some study, few studies looking at N-acetylcysteine or MAC, and that does seem to have some beneficial effects in a few studies with ADHD. And there's at least one study with pycnogenol. Difficulty with these studies are using them as evidence that this is proof that there's a mitochondrial problem is that definitely for EPA, DHA, and also for N-acetylcysteine, these are molecules that aren't only antioxidants. They have other beneficial effects on the body. So one thing is that they affect inflammatory levels. They can, EPA and DHA are very clearly important for damping down overactive inflammatory levels. So it may be through inflammation effects rather than direct mitochondrial effects that are helping with ADHD. The other thing that DHA and EPA are part of them after they're eaten, that's incorporated directly into cell membranes. And if you change the ratio of omega-3 fatty acids to omega-6 fatty acids in your diet, you change your composition of your cell membranes, and you can measurably change how receptors work or don't work, including neural receptors on the surface of cells. So again, proof that antioxidants are helpful for ADHD, which is we have a small body of research, which is encouraging in that way, is only partially confirming that that shows mitochondrial damage or dysfunction has 
contributing to ADHD. The other thing that's fascinating and part of why so many aging researchers, dementia researchers, mental health researchers are paying more attention to mitochondria is in the last decade, we've learned that they're doing far more than just serving as powerhouses of the cells. So we've known for some while that the process of apoptosis, how normal, healthy cells go through a lifetime and once they become sick and old, are selectively and carefully killed off. Mitochondria are also intimately involved in producing and regulating neurotransmitters. So they're involved. Mitochondrial membrane has proteins, enzymes that are involved in making norepinephrine, dopamine, serotonin. Clearly, if you're messing with neurotransmitter production or regulation, that could have implications across the brain. And not just neurotransmitters, but mitochondria are important for synthesizing hormones, testosterone, estrogen, cortisol, all of which have important effects throughout the brain. Not only that, mitochondria are having a huge role in shutting off or on inflammatory states. So we like to look at systems in isolation, but these are lots of systems that are interacting and working with each other. And maybe most importantly, epigenetics. So, you know, your genes are important. They limit or shape what your potential might be, but more importantly, at some level than what genes you inherit are which ones are activated. And methylation, phosphorylation, other chemical changes can inactivate genes. I can activate genes. Probably the most important organelle structure in the cell, in your cells responsible for epigenetics is the mitochondria. So mitochondria are doing a lot. We still haven't sorted it all out. There is mild evidence. Mitochondrial dysfunction may have a role in contributing to ADHD, but we still have a lot to learn. There's probably almost no risk of damage or eating diets high in antioxidants. So dark chocolate, blueberries, curcumin, from turmeric are good sources of antioxidants. And as some people pointed out, to traits that at least in adults with ADHD, obesity, and cigarette smoking are overrepresented in the ADHD population. Both of those are also linked with higher levels of oxidative stress. So stopping smoking and getting weight under control can also be having an effect, positive effect on your mitochondria. So stay healthy, stay happy, and have a great week. 